BizTax ESG Conversation Show. Today, we dive into the ESG conversation with experts from the Asian School of Business out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Now, we have with us today Dr. Malati Nungsari. She's the Deputy Dean for Research at the Asian School of Business and International Faculty Fellow at MIT. Now, alongside Dr. Peter Steck, he's the postdoctoral scholar at the Asian School of Business as well. The Asian School of Business is a graduate business school in Kuala Lumpur that offers MBA, uh, EMBA, and Masters in Central Banking programs. Now, ASB is a collaboration between MIT Sloan School of Management and Bank Nagara Malaysia, which is the central bank of Malaysia. Now, the conversation today is about ESG practices and how they are transforming business businesses across ASEAN and Korea. Integrating ESG is no longer about just doing the, a good thing or, or the right thing, but it's really become a necessity for businesses to thrive. Now to tell us more, welcome to the show, Dr. Malati and Dr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Now, for a start, Malati, could you give us an overview of your research paper around the ESG practices in ASEAN and Korea, the pathways towards sustainability? Uh, yeah, so this program uh, project was basically done over the course of 18 months. Um, it is a kind of a comprehensive look at what is happening in the ESG space across Southeast Asia. Um, so we basically reviewed, uh, you know, policy documents at national level, looked at all the different types of legal frameworks adopted by different countries, but we also spoke to all the important stakeholders. So think about ESG service providers, um, companies that operate in the ESG space. Um, we talked to financial institutions, we talked to regulators. Um, so I'd like to think it's a pretty comprehensive look at what is being done in Southeast Asia. Uh, now, we also had covered a little bit of uh, sort of learnings from Korea as well. The study was commissioned by the ASEAN Korea Center. Uh, so we got to understand, you know, what's happening in Korea, what can Southeast Asia learn from Korea, and kind of best practices from every country. Okay, then, and, and either of you can pick this next question up. Why Korea? And, and are they ahead of the curve compared to the rest of ASEAN in the ASG space? Um, yeah, I can maybe try and answer that question first. I think um, Korea, amongst like China, Korea, Japan, is always is, a, is always a smaller economy, which is therefore more export dependent. Um, so they tend to be very keen on trend following, and they do this in many areas of technology as well. Um, so I think um, the the ASEAN Korea Center realized that ESG is really taking center stage, also in the relationship between Korea and the ASEAN region, and, and that is why they went for it. Now, in terms of uh, whether Korea is leading, sure, in some areas, Korea is doing very well. Uh, for instance, you've got the Korean emission trading uh, system uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. There, it's definitely leading in Asia. Uh, but in other areas, it's, it's not always doing as well. And you mentioned before about, for instance, board representation. A uh, number of female board members in Korea is extremely low, especially if compared to ASEAN standards, where countries like Vietnam, Malaysia far outperform. Now then, can I ask then within the, the, the ASEAN context, what has your research shown in terms of some of the countries that are perhaps leading in the forefront of ESG implementation across not only the public companies, but just for overall from a regulatory standpoint. So I, I think one thing that uh, is quite striking is that when we look at sort of the region overall, there's quite a lot of diversity and different focuses for what each country does. So if we're looking at, you know, ESG data collection, uh, green finance, we have leaders like Singapore. If we're looking at countries like Vietnam, we think a little bit more about uh, manufacturing. We think a little bit more about um, sustainable agriculture, um, stuff like that. So I would say there are different countries sort of focusing on different parts um, of sort of the ESG landscape. And so that is what makes it both interesting, but also I think quite uh, difficult to kind of apply one standard across all 10 member states. And, and also, this is also a, a broader issue around the fact that a, a lot of uh, investors tend to look at ASEAN as 
as a block of 600 million plus people. But the reality is ASEAN is made up of very diverse economies with different levels of, of development. And therefore, I think it becomes quite stark in terms of even ESG implementation. Countries like Malaysia and Singapore probably do a lot better than, say, countries like Cambodia. Yeah, you're correct. Um, but I think one thing that we have highlighted is uh, even countries like Cambodia are sort of working in their own space. Um, but when you sort of think about, you know, is it comparable in terms of national frameworks and sort of what, what is being doing, support provided to SMEs, for example, is it on par with Singapore, Malaysia? Of course not. Uh, but we do think that each country does contribute in different ways. Now, what are, from your research itself, what are the key trends that you're seeing uh, in ASEAN from a regulatory implementation and compliance standpoint. I, and perhaps, Peter, you can you can shed some light on this. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, for the ASEAN region, it's mainly developing countries. External drivers are very important. Uh, many ASEAN countries are deeply integrated into global supply chains, global value chains. And so those tend to be the areas where they tend to be early adopters because their supply chains demand it. And then in addition to that, you see more forward looking governments um, uh, looking at ways to improve ESG. So one area is perhaps financial regulation and central banking, where there is now an ASEAN taxonomy to make sure that all the financial authorities in ASEAN are kind of speaking the same language um, as they develop their ESG frameworks for financial markets. And then the final point is that you've, of course, got individuals, individual leaders of large businesses, sometimes small businesses, who are just pioneers trying out new things. Um, so those three areas are there. What is different, perhaps, for more developed market is that there is less of a grassroots drive towards ESG and demanding that, mainly because many people in ASEAN are not high income. This is not their first priority yet. Um, but of course, that's something that's changing as incomes rise across the region. So, Malati, people, uh, Peter, th this is an interesting thing around ASEAN compared to, say, North America or Europe. Essentially, there's no, no pressure from consumers to comply. It's more a pressure around customers or B2B customers uh, basically ensuring the, the B2B customers, assuming that in more developed economies like, say, Germany or the US, their businesses are forcing companies that supply to their supply chain to basically be ESG compliant. And that's, the, that's driving the first wave of ESG compliance across ASEAN. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I think there I, I is. Think so. oh, sorry. Yeah. I, no, no. I, so I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, the the sort of two main uh, international powers, I think, whose regulations kind of govern how things look like in Southeast Asia is, of course, the EU and the US. Um, but I do think that, you know, increasingly consumers are slowly kind of picking up on that. Um, so, you know, Southeast Asia is very young. So I think with the advent of like TikTok and social media and stuff like that, people are sort of realizing more and more that, you know, sustainable consumption is the way to go. And you should be demanding things of the products you purchase that maybe your parents or grandparents didn't think about before. But uh, you know what, let me give you a very specific example where even very young people who perhaps you would think would care about sustainability don't care very much. And really, uh, it's about fast fashion, which is a big culprit uh, from a sustainability perspective. And let me use an example of Xi'an, the Chinese company. People, yes. and my daughter included, they all buy Xi'an stuff, even though uh, they are quite poor, and shall I just use that uh, 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 very mildly, poor in terms of their compliance with sustainability uh, ESG uh, objectives. No, no, I I think that's right. I think, um, you know, when we're thinking about ESG adoption and sort of how consumers face it, I think there is a huge trade-off between price and sustainability, unfortunately, for the consumer. Um, and so, you know, teenagers tend to sort of, I think, be uh, more towards uh, a price-sensitive uh, cohort, I guess, and the other kind of professional group. Um, but I think it also is important to mention that even though, you know, younger people do buy Xi'an, I think the older, slightly older professionals and stuff like that are, are pretty conscious about, you know, what fast fashion means and how it's 
kind of filling up our landfills and stuff like that. So I do feel like, again, as a segment, it is changing, although you're absolutely right. I think price drives quite a bit of uh, some of these realizations. Now, Peter, I want to take up on what you just said just now. We talked about the, 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 Europe, for example, um, really driving, um, uh, so society in Europe and the US, perhaps driving change in, in terms of compliance with companies. The approval of the European Green Deal in 2020 sent alarm bells across Southeast Asia in particular because it, it was seen per potentially as a backdoor protectionist measure. Um, what are your thoughts on this and, and how has that changed in the last few years? Because there's an there is also an ASEAN Green Deal has been proposed by Cambodia. Perhaps uh, both of you could enlighten the audience on, on this shift in thinking. Yes. Yeah. Shall I start and then? Yes, um, go ahead. Sure. I, I think um, there, there's a few critical pieces of legislation. So there's the, the European Green Deal, which is a huge package from the European Parliament. You've also got the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which is about almost everything except inflation reduction. So <laughs> it involves um, returning manufacturing to the US, making it greener, uh, more sustainability driven, driving inflation, et cetera, et cetera. So they're both large pieces of industrial policy. Now, I think it's fair to say that whenever you talk about industrial policy, there's going to be politics involved and political economy involved. Um, so definitely, I think some of the measures in the, the Green Deal or the Inflation Reductions Act, you can characterize as protectionism. You can point out certain hypocrisies. At the same time, um, I think um, a lot of the lobbying effort now means that there's some very serious investment into these kind of sustainability programs, making sure supply chains are traceable, making sure that they're free from labor abuses and, and so on. And I think that has a real effect. Now, in comparing then the, the ASEAN Green Deal, you're really talking about different things. I mean, ASEAN has no massive budget. It isn't a tightly integrated economy like the US and the EU. So the kind of firepower behind the ASEAN Green Deal is at a completely different level. But I think it's valuable that Cambodia highlighted this, that basically ASEAN does need to prepare, does need to act, get its act together and be able to respond. So something like um, Europe's CBAM, uh, carbon import taxes, is maybe an area where there could be an ASEAN response to push back or at least to argue that it should be divided in a different way. Um, and, and that is perhaps where the Cambodian suggestion is most valuable. Kamalati, do you have anything to add Can to I, that? Yeah, I, I would. So I, I think uh, sort of the, the negative part, I just want to talk a bit more about the, the, the European Green Deal. So, you know, trade protectionism, sure. Um, but I think there are sort of two aspects of it that are kind of useful for the region. So the first one I wanted to highlight is actually um, this idea of peer effects. So what happens in the Southeast Asian uh, ESG landscape is, you know, there tends to be kind of, you know, if my neighbor does it, then I want to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think coordination amongst ASEAN countries is something that this Green Deal could potentially help push. So basically some sort of like realignment uh, around regulatory standards uh, may incentivize people you know, ASEAN countries basically adopt things that are compatible with uh, what the EU and the US are saying. So I think that could potentially be a big push for the Southeast Asian ESG landscape. And the second thing I wanted to talk about, which Peter touched on, is sort of this idea of, you know, investments into making things more ESG compliant. So I think there could potentially be quite a lot of uh, technology transfer, um, you know, between the EU and Southeast Asia when, you know, things sort of start ramping up with regards to this. I think it was ratified in, what, 2020? Um, I believe. So, you know, perhaps more coordination surrounding what can we learn, uh, more tech transfers, that could be a good thing for the region. Okay, now, I'm gonna, you want to hold that thought, and I'm going to ask you then a different question around investment. So, mm. there are opportunities from a sectorial perspective, which are the sectors in ASEAN that are most promising in terms of attracting ESG investment? not only from the region, but from outside of the region. Ooh, we wrote a bunch of special chapters on this. Peter, you <laughs> want to take it? 
I, I think in, in, in different sectors, there are different areas that, that, that offer opportunities. I mean, a, a big one is infrastructure, right? Infrastructure and construction, ASEAN still has huge investments of there in there. Many are not particularly green. They're very traditional. Okay, and tell so us, give us some specific examples because people may be watching this and have lots of money to write a check on. Well, I mean, you, you've got still a lot of like um, airport construction, traditional port construction going on, whereas maybe you should be spending more on high speed rail, commuter rail areas like that. And um, that, that would be an infrastructure one. I think another okay. uh, big problem has to do with bankability, that mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's very hard to do a pure sustainability projects profitably. Uh, but let's say you do, um, what do you call it, a water cleaning a treatment installation, and then you can connect it to the sludge, you can sell it uh, maybe as a fertilizer or something, do some treatment process, then suddenly the process becomes much more bankable. So being much more creative in, first of all, accepting new technologies, accepting ideas and tying things together to finance that green infrastructure and not just saying, oh, well, sorry, uh, the financial backing isn't there. The bank doesn't think it's bankable too bad. But it's also a financial modeling thing, isn't it? Because there are funds that are willing to accept lower returns if certain projects are ESG compliant. So it's about blending the financial model to make it work. So a, a combination perhaps of bank financing plus subsidized financing for ESG investment, and then the project becomes bankable. Am I backing up the right tree here? Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you. And I think it's also something that needs time, right? I mean, yeah. maybe 10 years ago, if you want to have photovoltaics on your rooftop and you enter your bank, they would think you're crazy. I'm not going to finance your photovoltaics. It's your hobby. Now, if you walk into any bank, you get a brochure. Please go get a loan from us and put photovoltaics on your roof. So the financial sector needs to learn how to finance these new things. Now and I think what... Sorry, to, just to add a little bit to that, I think one thing that has sort of, you know, been in the media is something that different countries are chasing is also sort of the EV craze. Mm -hmm. So EV cars, EV batteries, uh, different countries courting, you know, all sorts of different incentives for companies to sort of set up here. I know Malaysia is trying, Indonesia has, of course, made a, a large headway in this in Vietnam as well. Um, so I think there are definitely a lot of things happening here. And hopefully good things, um, because as we know, manufacturing can also come with its problems in terms of pollution and human rights. Now, I want to take a more narrow view. We've, we've taken a very broad view of ASEAN. Now, ASB, or Asian School of Business, is based in Malaysia. Give us a report card of Malaysia. Where is Malaysia at from, and I'll give you different perspectives, at an SME level, uh, at a regulatory level, and also then at a financial services level. Ooh. Uh, I can take a stab. I mean, I think Malaysia does pretty well in financial services. It, it has always had a very uh, yeah, well-regulated financial sector. And us being owned by Bank Negara makes us completely impartial in saying this. <laughs> uh, and also, after all, like, I must stress this. Bursa Malaysia has been one of the leading exchanges <laughs> uh, in the forefront of executing uh, ESG compliance among the, 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 the member can, uh, companies? Yes, I think they have. But I think the, 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 the main issue here in Malaysia is a bit that the government regulation hasn't quite caught up. So we've done interviews with tons of SMEs and the main thing they say is, yeah, we would love to get this certification or get green bonds or whatnot. Number one, we usually don't know where to start. Who do we call? And number two is, even if we did it, we don't know if there's a market for it. And we've maybe tried one or two things and we couldn't make it work financially. So unless the kind of the carbon taxes are there or the real hard incentives, financial incentives, uh, I, I don't think you're going to see rapid adoption. So I think in Malaysia for SMEs, of course, the ones that are plugged into global supply chain, yes, they're awake, they're aware. Mm -hmm. But for many of them, yeah, the regulation isn't there. They're not sure what financial facility to call. So you can't really expect them to move in the short term. And there's also a lack of information, I think, yeah. like specifically for the SMEs. I think, uh, uh, like Peter mentioned, it's sort of hard to, even as researchers, you know, coming into the space, sort of hard to know like what incentives do I qualify for? What support does my business get if we want to sort of, you know, 
uh, make some parts of our business more sustainable? What financing options are there? I feel like even if there are initiatives are not very well communicated. And if you think about it from sort of the government perspective, different initiatives may sit with different ministries. And so in terms of communication to companies, I think it has been a bit jumbled up in terms of what's available. So that's one recommendation we had in the report was essentially just kind of streamline a little bit so people know what's there out there for them. Uh, and, and that was what my next question, which you, you, you've, uh, you've sort of answered already partially. Based on your report, what are the next steps and recommendations that, that you put forth uh, for governments in the region to, to execute? Well, I think regulation is definitely one of them. I think another area we highlighted is the idea of green procurement, that, that government yeah. spends 10, 15% of GDP is government spending. If you put in ESG requirements for that procurement and you help your contractors upscale, um, your suppliers upscale, that can play a huge role. Um, and, and also, especially for SMEs. I mean, SMEs are very dependent on the outside world always because they're small. So having the regulatory framework, the reporting framework, so that they don't have to go prove to a purchaser in, in Germany or, or in Japan that they are compliant with ABC. No, no, no. It's Malaysia. It's always compliant. We always know that it is because Malaysia has this regulatory framework in place. You don't have to worry about it. That's extremely helpful for SMEs. Malati, any, anything to add there? No, no, I, I agree with what Peter said, but I think, again, just going back into the information, there is a sense in which if policies and incentives are set at the national level, but they don't actually trickle down to what people are doing at the grassroots, to what the companies are doing and stuff like that, there essentially is no use. So I think one thing that we sort of push a little bit more is not only for Malaysia, but for other countries as well, to make it very clear what support is available for SMEs. Um, SMEs in Malaysia, for example, I think constitute, what, 97% of uh, total employment, mm -hmm. uh, so huge hugely important and this is something that I shared across Southeast Asia but you know letting them know what support is available after all these policies is put in place is going to be very very crucial. Malaki and Peter it's been a, a very educational uh, uh, conversation and I really learned a lot but before we leave any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with I'm going to start with Peter. Well, I think uh, what we need to remember is that ESG is only going to happen when the incentives are in place. And government has an important role to play to make sure that those SMEs don't get left behind. But in response to that, also industry associations need to lobby government. They need to say, you need to regulate us now. You need to impose the right regulations because otherwise we're not going to win this race. Malati? What I wanted to add was, I think a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, because of how climate vulnerable the countries are, tend to focus quite a bit on the E. But I think uh, for me personally, given my research interests, I think more focus on different types of social issues would be really relevant. Uh, so things like, you know, maybe I'd not be able to see this in my in my lifetime, but things like, you know, gay rights, rights for people who are mar marginalized, vulnerable people. These are changes that I hope uh, the landscape gets to embrace a bit more in the future, things that, you know, can potentially push things forward by quite a bit. So focus a bit more on the S, I think, would be nice. And uh, actually, that echoes something that I personally believe in, but that's a topic for another day to discuss. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Malati and Dr. Peter, for, for taking your time to be on the show. Thank, Thank you, Brian. you. Now, we've been speaking to Dr. Malati Nungsari. She's the Deputy Dean for Research at the Asia School of Business and an International Faculty Fellow at MIT, and together with Dr. Peter Steck, a postdoctoral scholar at the Asian School of Business. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to BizTech's ESG Conversation Show. This interview will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.